Okay, now, uh, you all should be pretty well prepared for this. Everybody pretty quickly and easily got the rate of change. Okay, so we have a problem. Population increases from A thousand to D thousand, or A and D or your unique numbers. That's between year B and year G. So what's the change, rate of change of population with respect to time? That's the first question. You need to stop right there and answer that question. Then go on, or you can read ahead and say, well, what am I gonna do with it? Okay, I'm gonna find the linear function that represents population P of T, okay? Population P as a function of time. Now, later on, I gave you a hint. Some of you needed, some of you didn't, okay? But the you know, standard equation for a straight line is y equals mx plus b. Now, I didn't say the population increases linearly, and I should have. Okay, but it increases linearly. Um, and that's kind of implicit because that's exactly what you were asked to do on your homework. Uh, and, and, you know, people did well in the homework, uh, sometimes up to the point where you had to find the equation. I had some people who always found this, but usually didn't get the beat quite right. So, you know, we kind of want to focus on that. Okay, well, how do you find the rate of change? Well, now I prefer delta y over delta x because that's much closer to the meaning. Change in one quantity divided by the change in the other. And the equation you're given is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. You don't see the meaning as clearly unless you think to think about it. Okay. If you don't, if you use this equation without thinking about what it means, and without thinking it's the change in this divided by the change in that, which is really a pretty intuitive notion. Okay. If I tell you how many dollars you make and how many hours you work to make it, you'll immediately figure out how many dollars per hour, won't you? Okay. If you make $80 in 10 hours, how much, how many dollars will you make in per hour? Okay. Well, you tell me, everybody can divide 80 by 10 and that's what you're going to do. You know that. If I tell you, you travel 200 miles in four hours, you're probably going to pretty naturally tell me, well, I have to go 50 miles each hour. That's 50 miles per hour. It's a natural calculation. And if you reduce it to this formula and never think about what's natural about the calculation, you're not gonna understand rate of change in a way that allows you to apply it in unfamiliar situations. It's always the same. You might have to think about what it means. You know, what's the rate of change of uh, dimorphosis orbit around Didymus. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? I don't know if you're paying attention because you might be really busy. You know, they just slammed the uh, massive spaceship into an asteroid, and they're going to see if the orbit changes. And that gives them an idea of the potential for doing something similar if an asteroid is aimed at us, okay? So I figure from the asteroid's orbit that it's gonna hit us. Well, you send a spacecraft up, it takes about a year to get there, so you better have advance notice. You send a spacecraft up and slam into it, change its orbital speed around the sun just a little bit, and that changes its orbit. And then it doesn't hit the earth, okay? Uh, so it's kind of a big deal. Well, what's the rate of change? Well, what they're really looking at, what's the rate of change of that asteroid's 
orbital speed around that. Well, it's it's a you got a small asteroid, smaller asteroid orbiting with a bigger one. Okay, and if you change that orbital period, it should work. Now, I calculated it. You calculate in your head if you you know approximate the change in that asteroid's orbital speed. I've calculated to be, and I haven't written it out, so maybe I did something wrong, but I'm thinking it's in the order of millimeters per second. It's very little change in its speed, but they say that, um, and I haven't worked this out yet, and I can't, can't it's just physics one. Uh, that should change its orbital, or orbital period by about 10 minutes. It orbits every 11 hours, okay? So you can talk about the rate of change of the orbital period, okay, uh, with respect to how much momentum that spacecraft uh, imparted to the asteroid. I mean, the asteroid's like 5 billion tons, the one we hit, okay? The one it orbits is like 50 billion tons. Yeah, a billion tons, what's a billion tons? A block of concrete about this big be about a ton. Okay. Line up a thousand of those. And then do a thousand lines and a thousand layers. That's a billion. Okay. So you can imagine that. Uh, pretty big, pretty big pile of concrete. And the asteroid. Uh, Three of me and my prime could pick it up. Okay. And you know, in my prime, I wasn't the strongest guy in the gym. It's fairly strong for my size, but you know, nothing to brag about. Okay. So just 170 pound guy, three of them could pick the thing up. Okay. So it's nowhere near 5 billion tons of spacecraft that we slammed into the thing. Okay. Uh, you know, four average guys could carry it. It's about 1,300 pounds, okay? Everybody's got 300 pounds. So you got, yeah, you know, four, okay, six average guys, <laughs> okay? Uh, four could probably carry, but they might hurt themselves. Okay. Uh, but most people can pick up that most from that right. Okay, so that's getting far from the idea. Again, we're talking about the rate of change of that asteroid's orbit with the amount of momentum. Now, if I say, talk about the rate of change of an asteroid's period of orbit with respect to the momentum of the projectile that slams into it, my point is that that's a little hard to think about. Even though if you really think about what I said, it actually kind of makes sense. But if you just see that in a newspaper article, although nobody's going to write a newspaper article that says that because that's a big chunk to digest. Okay. And other rate of change situations. Uh, you know, what's the rate of change of recovery from an infection? with respect to the amount of antibiotic you get. That's kind of relevant. Uh, okay. All that is just, there's a meaning to rate of change and it's maybe the most important concept you're gonna get in the whole course, the whole pre-calculus course because rate of change is the most fundamental concept in an applied calculus course or any calculus course. Calculus is built on the idea of rate of change. And if you're in a curriculum that has an applied calculus or you know, a full blown calculus course, uh, you're going to want to understand it. Uh, okay, well, I talked a little longer than I should have about that idea, but it's a really important idea. So I'm just going to say here very important. I'm sorry.
So we're trying to build that concept with a relatively simple example that's pretty easy to understand. And uh, if you want to understand why you're using this formula, what the formula means, and what that's telling you about the situation. Okay, so with that said, Okay, in my case, uh, let's use 5,000. Well, excuse me. Let's say it's 9,000 minus 5,000. And it's year G, let's say year G is 21, and year B is. Okay. So that's 4,000 over 13. We can leave it that way. Or we can say, well, that's about 370. Have a quick mental calculation. Check it out. 13 goes into 3,930 times. 300 pounds uh, and let it left over. Uh, okay, anyhow. What's that mean? And then people per year. Populations in people, we'll assume it's people, it could be population or bird or something. We'll assume it's people, and this is years. So it's people per year. Okay? People divided by, because you got people here divided by years here. It's people divided by years, and you read that people per year. Now that has a meaning, it means you get about 370 additional people every year. And I think you probably understand that, but you want to think through all the meanings. That's one thing I want to stress because it's pretty easy to calculate. Again, if you're just using this formula, you can miss all that unless you think about it. So you want to think about means. Okay, so you have 370 people here now. How do you get the population? Well, there are two ways. Uh, and if you don't think right away in terms of these equations. Make a graph of P versus T. If I'm doing a graph of P versus T where P goes up to 9,000, well, I'm going to put 8,000 here and divide that into half to get 4,000. I divide that in half to get 2,000. I'm not going to mark my 1,000. I'll mark my 6,000 here. I mean, I'm not going to label my 1,000 because it gets too crowded. So I see how big a 1,000 is. So I add one of those up here. And here's 9,000. Now, I might want to project forward to see how many people I have after 20 more years. In which case, I'll adjust this axis. You know, if, if, if the question said, how many people are there going to be then 20 years later? Then you'd want to go 20 years. Well, I'm sorry. If I ask the question, how long is it going to take the, thousand, the population to reach 20,000? Probably not a realistic model because population usually doesn't grow that linearly. But uh, you'd want to have this axis go all the way up to 20,000, right? And you could do estimates. Okay. Now, my time goes up to year 21. So I'm going to go to year 32 here. Because if I divide that in half, I get 16. Divide that in half, I get 8. Halfway here is 24. 
Here's four. Here's 12. Here's 20. Here's 28. And then I can divide these in half to get my even number here. So now I can divide these in half. But I'm not going to do that because I've got enough that I can now figure out where 21 and 8 go. Okay. So 21 goes 2020 20 and 24. Well, here's 20, here's 24, here's 22. So here must be 21. So I'm going to attempt to draw a vertical line through T equals 21. And of course, that's my year G, and my population is my D thousand, which is nine thousand in my case. And here P equals nine thousand, so I've got a point. That's year B is year eight, and I've got my mark for eight here, so. Here's T equals eight, and the population is 4,500, sorry. Now I've got two points in my graph, and if I can sketch a straight line, kind of wobbles there, but I think it was aimed about here. I see that it appears to intersect the T axis around 3,000, around, yeah, around, 2,500, right? Okay, so at this point, I think it's a different color, it's a different estimate. The y intercept is approximately at p equals 100. So I think the approximate equation is well, let's kind of complete the picture here. Um, I can do this on the graph. I can say that my run here is from t equals a to t equals 21. That's 13. My rise is Nine thousand minus five thousand, which is four thousand. Well, my run is my change in t. My rise is my change in t. And my slope is rise over run, which is. Four thousand over thirteen. If I had more room, I'd write that's approximately three hundred seventy or whatever I get from my calculator. Okay. So there's a complete picture of this situation with everything you need to, first of all, calculate the rate of change. The rate of change is delta y over delta x. Well, really, you know. In this case, let's call it delta P over delta T. Okay. I 
there's more to the argument is that the rate of change of populations of populations of birth. So you calculate that's a numerator, the change of population. And when it says with respect to time, that means you're going to use delta T now. Okay. Now, the approximate equation. If T is approximately three hundred and seventy T plus twenty five hundred. Now the accurate model. Algebraic is y equals mx plus b, but better p equals mt plus b because it's not y and x, it's p and t. Well, M were calculated before we drew the graph. Um, four thousand over thirteen, or about three seventy. Well, I see four thousand over thirteen. Just to make it harder to calculate. Uh, and we have a question, so let's see what we can do about that. Okay, you know, I was a little thinking this, you know. 13 goes into 3,900, leaves 100. 13 goes into 100, but seven times is not 370. 370 is ridiculous. And somebody finally pointed it out. Yeah, okay. And it actually kind of rounds off to 308 because seven, 13 goes into 91 seven times, 104 eight times. Uh, closer to 308 than 307, which is not the reason I wanted to use the numbers here, okay? Okay, uh, and it makes it a little harder to calculate, which means I'll probably do something even dumber when I do that. But we'll just deal with it. Okay, so M is 4,000 4, over 13, and we can use um, P equals 9,000 when T equals 21, or P equals 5,000 when T equals 8. Okay, for the P and T. So we can plug in, let's say, 5,000 and 8. Here's our information. So now, plug 5,000 in for P, 4,000 over 13 for M, and A for T, and we add that to B. Okay. Well, Eight times 4,000 is 32,000. 32,000 divided by 13, about the same thing as 308 times eight, so I'm gonna cheat, that's easy. It's 2,464. If I did my arithmetic right, which is always doubtful, that's 2,460, which makes my 2,500 look real good because now we can say V is approximately equal to 5,000 minus 2,460, which is 2,540. Okay. So this is a better model. If I did my arithmetic right, I just lucked out when I drew that line because you know, this graph isn't totally 
Uh oh, accurate. Got another question. I think I'm getting another correction here. Okay, lab. Welcome, lab. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What the correction was it should be 2464. Yeah, it should. Remember, 308 was a little bit of an overestimate, so I compensated. I also put the approximate equal there. And as I said, that lets me do anything I want. Well, that doesn't, but I need to be reasonably accurate. But this is actually a little more accurate than the 64 would have been. Okay. Uh, should be maybe, it, I'll stick my neck out. It should be um, 61 point something. If I actually use 4,013. Then I could check that. I could divide 13 into 32,000 in my head. And it goes into 26,200 times, leaving 613 into 600 is 13 to 650 is, um, it'd be 50. Okay. And, and uh, still going to come up pretty close to this. I, I, I think we're okay. If we are, you've got your calculators, you can do your arithmetic accurately. Okay. It's quicker for me to be up here making mistakes than it is for me to be up here pushing the calculator, something I'm philosophically opposed to anyway. I don't do arithmetic with calculus. If I got to do accurate arithmetic, I go to the computer and use it. So it allows me to type the numbers in, which is much faster than punching them on the calculator. Okay. Uh, and after I've calculated the whole thing about the orbit of the asteroid, um, then I'll go to some software and see how close I got. But if I get something around 10 minutes, I'll know that NASA is probably right. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, anyhow, now, thus, we can say P of T is approximately three hundred eighty plus twenty five hundred and forty. And now I've got a model that allows me to predict the population at any time, assuming that the population grows literally. Now it really does and it grows exponentially, it tends to grow exponentially, but it depends on the situation. Okay. Uh, natural population, it, 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 uh, the more critters you got, the more reproduction it's going to be. As long as they don't start crowding each other, run out of food and stuff. Uh, that's a different model, and we will be talking about those kinds of models a little bit later on. So, a linear approximation here is really kind of artificial, but over relatively short periods, linear approximation can work well. Okay. Well, that's probably more than you want to know about rate of change, but. Believe me, it's good for you. Well, as I said, we can use this equation to predict populations at different times. So this moves us right into the next assignment, which is on linear equations. Um, let's do this in context of this model. Now, before anybody corrects me, I'm using 300 and 2,500 just because the numbers are easy and I'm going to ask you to do something, okay? And it's probably close enough anyway, because, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, uh, depending on your application. It's going to still be a pretty close model.
One thing we want to do, estimate the population of T equals 24. That's very simple. And almost as simple as um, Determine when the population will reach 10,000. Okay, first place, if T equals 24, then you just replace T by 24. And you find that P of 24, which is your population after 24 years, because that's what P of T means, is three. 100 times 24, that almost looks like a two T makeup. 300 times 24, just plug your 24 in for T, just function notation, and right there you've got it. Okay, so we can easily predict the population at any point within the appropriate domain of this model. Remember, domains are important. This model probably doesn't work up to the year. 2090, <laughs> okay, you know, things are gonna change, things are gonna fluctuate, you're gonna have migration, you know, people get jobs elsewhere, get jobs here, whatever. Um, or just like living in this place and then tastes change and they don't anymore. Okay, uh, so over a period of a lot of years, you don't expect this model to be valid. But maybe the domain of this uh, would be from year eight up through year three. And you use that uh, in planning, you know, how, how you, if, if you're in town management, how do you plan facilities and utilities and all that? Okay, anyhow, this question, Say population is 10,000. Means P of T is the population. P of T equals 10,000. Well, if P of T equals 10,000, that's an equation. But you want to say what P of T is? Well, that's 300 T. Plus 2,500 equals 10,000. So, when you get up here, so now how do we solve this equation? Well, this should be familiar to you uh, if you've had the usual prerequisite courses, but I'm not going to. Got to more or less assume that, but I'm going to talk about the details anyway. But you see that you just subtract 2,500 from both sides, and then divide by 300. Does that seem about right? Okay, you should be used to that. But if you're rusty, or if you didn't really get it when you had it, uh, well. Let's do this formally because we do want to get used to doing our algebra by the rules instead of by just what it looks like. So hopefully what it looks like to you is you move that 2,500 over here and you buy about 300. But there's no moving over here here. There's only add or subtract from both sides, multiply or divide both sides by the same thing. And I assume that's familiar. So.
So we have negative 2,500 on both sides. Now, you're going to want to do it this way, so I'm going to write it out the way you're going to want to do it, because that's the way you were taught to do it. But it takes up way too much paper to do it that way. So I'm usually not going to write it that way, because I don't have paper. I've got black. <laughs> okay. And also, you need to see it both ways. You need to understand what you're doing. Okay, so let's take 300 feet plus 2,500 equals 10,000. Put a comma in there so we know where the break is. And then you do negative 2,500 here and negative 2,500 here. Okay. That's the way you usually write it out, isn't it? You usually put an equal in here. If you've been taught to do this without putting the equal sign in here, I respectfully, semi respectfully disagree because you're adding two equations. And you should be used to adding two equations because you're going to need to add two equations when we get near the end of the course, actually pretty soon in your course. And linear functions, you're going to have two linear functions, you're going to have to add equations. So you might as well see this from the beginning to understand theoretically what's going on. You're adding two things that are equal. To the same side, to, to the two sides of this equation. So your equation stays in balance. Did I do that thing with the dominoes last time? Balancing the dominoes? Okay. So we add these two equations and we get 300t equal 7500. That's perfectly valid mathematics. Putting the 2500, negative 2500 here and the negative 2500 here without an equal sign is not valid mathematics. It's a superstition that works if you do it right. Okay. So if you do this, I'd like you to put the equal sign in there. I'm not going to penalize if you don't, as long as you get it right. But it's going to be better for you in the long run if you start putting equal signs in if you're going to do it this way. Okay. Then you divide both sides by 300. And you get 7,500 over 300. Well, 300 T over 300 is just 300 over 300 times T over one. Because, of course, if you multiply this out, multiply numerators and denominators, you get this. Over here, you get 25. And this is just 1 times t over 1 equals 25, so t equals 25. More detail than you want to go into in the equation, you should think this. Because some people just like to cross things out and think that they're canceling. They are, but they're probably not canceling right in all cases. I've talked about cancellation, haven't I? I don't like it until you really know the rules, cancel factors. Uh, and people don't generally come in to this course or to a pre-calculus course knowing what the heck that means. They just start crossing stuff out and it looks right to do it, okay? And to some people, it looks just fine to cross out this three here and this three here. Just pick a couple of threes in the page and cross them out. Well, not quite that bad, but nearly that bad. Um, or just, you know, cross out some zeros. Let's see, cross out this zero and this zero. That's a cancellation, isn't it? No, it isn't. But again, people do things almost that bad if they don't understand the rules, and most don't. So I'm not going to assume that you do, but eventually I'm going to show you what the rules are, and I think you will, because y'all are smart, <laughs> okay? And maybe you do, maybe you do. Uh, but uh, it's unusual to have more than one person in 10 that really understands cancellation. Okay. Uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to solve the equation once more. I 
I don't leave myself much room, so I better do this carefully and linearly. By throwing things up, but linearly, I mean not mathematical linearity, just physical linearity. Meaning, write things out along a straight line. Because I don't have room to do all this. Okay? I don't have room to do this. Then I get 300T equals 7,500. Then I divide both sides by 300. Then I write it out linear. So t equals 25. Put a circle around that. And I should go back and check that. Now, at least one person, after calculating the 9700, said, well, it's going up 300 a year. So it's just going to be another year. We get 9,724 years. Another year, we're going to add 300. That's going to be 10,000. And just essentially using the rate of change to see what's going to happen. And that was good. But I can't always do that. So you have to understand that to figure out when the population will reach a certain number, you have to set P of T equal to that, giving you an equation that you can solve. Now, I think you all are good with Most of the techniques of equation solving that you're going to see in this assignment. So I think you're going to find this to be a pretty easy assignment, but if you don't, that could be that hard. Might be moderate, but it ain't going to be a hard assignment for you guys. Okay. But do it carefully, write everything out to reinforce what the operations mean. Okay. So let me just give you one. Uh, so let's we'll use X this time. I think you can solve that in three minutes. Okay. Uh, I don't think y'all need much on this. Everybody's done the first step with the distributive law and everything else is going to follow. But just in case, it's going to take a little time to go over this. I've got more than a minute. That should be enough. So I do the distributive law here. I get 10x minus 6. And then minus five times all of this. And this is a minus five. If you use the plus five, um, I didn't write that minus sign quite clearly enough. It's okay. It's going to look a little different. But the distributive law, you apply the distributive law, and there it is. Okay. Then, you know what to do. You get negative 50x here. Negative 35 and 40 is plus 5. At this stage, you're practically home free. You add 50x to both sides. And the 50x here and the 50x here add up to 0. 10x here and 50x here, 60x. You have 60x minus 6 equals 5. Add 6 to both sides, you get 60x equals 11. 60x over 60 is 11 over 60. x equals 11 over 6. And you just leave that as a fraction, unless you're an open math and they want a decimal answer, then you punch it into your calculator and you get 0.183 repeating. Okay, I think. So again, I think people are in pretty good shape on this. I don't think this assignment is gonna hurt you at all.
but make sure you do it and write everything out to reinforce the rules. Because you're gonna need them when the equations get really hairy and they will.